Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, it's been a little while since we put out a video to help you along the way for this Ultra Cross Collard project where we're doing this community seed selection, but I'm happy to have Ira back with us to talk a little bit about some of these collards. Uh, just one, one quick intro from me is that uh, I run a, a Leicester Library Giving Garden, which is just like a community garden near where I live, and we were able to plant out a whole bunch of these collards. So they've I've been able to observe them most days and see how they grow. And we've also been eating them and sharing them with the community. And the hope was with these collards, because they'd intercrossed amongst these 21 different parent varieties, was that we'd see like a huge amount of diversity. And it was it was very clear early on that we've got all sorts of mixed up genetics in there, which is what we wanted. And it's just been really fun to see different colors, different leaf shapes, different plant structures growing through. And um, and it's also been exciting that we've been able to share them with so many people and have pretty good feedback on how they taste. Now, I would say if you're comparing, you know, your supermarket colored to any colored that you grow at home, it's probably going to be superior. Um, but what we're hoping is that these heirloom collards and this mix that we're developing with you all is going to be developed to be like extremely delicious. So we've got uh, chef friends on board that are helping with tasting and selection on that as well. So we're really going for something that's like extremely tasty as well as this cold tolerance. So I talking about delicious collards, then uh, I know Ira is a massive fan of collards and I thought it might be fun if you could just share how you've been enjoying the collards that you're growing and, and maybe a favorite way to prepare them? Well, uh, lately we've been big on making bone broth. Uh, our friends nearby at Pink House Pigs, they have pigs and chickens and they sell uh, you know, to local folks. And we, they've been giving us massive amounts of bones, <laughs> make bone broth. And let me tell you that bone broth with uh, some uh, perennial green onions and uh, collards is mighty tasty, mighty tasty. And what do, uh, what do you do? You you slice the collards and put them in it like a soup or you're making the bone yeah. broth with the collards? Well, mostly, sometimes we use this collard stems as a part of the uh, broth making, but, uh, Usually we make the broth, cook it like 12 hours or so, and then strain it. And then uh, we will saute some onions or some garlic and, uh, and then chop up the collards. We, we like to cut them really uh, thin because a lot of, we have a lot of Northerners who uh, have transplanted and who didn't grow up with collards. So, when you have smaller individual pieces, the the texture is more to their liking. So we cut them, uh, you know, chiffonade them, or put or chop them somewhat finely, and then put them in. And then, uh, according to who's the cook, uh, either you do that in the last for the last like ten or fifteen minutes, or you put it in about an hour ahead so that they're very well cooked and more traditional Southern texture. So, and both of them are really good. Um, and uh, we, you can add salt to taste. A lot of people, if you add salt and a little vinegar, uh, they like it both for the way it perks up the natural broth flavors and uh, how it makes the, it's almost, it makes the sweetness of the collard come through more as well. It's interesting about the, uh, the cooking time and the texture. One, one feedback we've, I've heard from a few people that have experienced these collards is that they're just, they're so much more tender than supermarket collards. And so you don't have to cut them as long for them to be, you know, real delicious uh, in, in whatever preparation you're doing. And, I guess that's maybe something we should keep in the back of our mind as we're doing selections as well. It's not just the base flavor, it's also like that, that texture component uh, of the collards can make a big difference too. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's something that was, you know, a lot of these collards came from backyard seed savers, or at least the parents did. Yeah. Um, I, is that something 
in kind of like a historical context that you think people cared about? I, I think it must have been because, you know, uh, it, it's according to how far back we go, but uh, fuel is a consideration. So things that could uh, cook uh, more quickly are on a lower flame, I think, you know, had a certain amount of preference. Uh, but uh, I know that a lot of them, like the, a lot of these blue collars, for example, are definitely tender. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I never knew about them until we started this collared project. Uh, so, um, yeah. It's, I pretty think it's pretty exciting to see see all those differences come through. That's one common comment I get from the chefs that experience them is even the chefs weren't aware of so much diversity and they're just really excited to dig into all the differences. Oh, you know, the other thing that I forgot is uh, we take a, a massage kale recipe uh, and we massage the leaves whole and then uh, put them together, roll them up and cut them up small after the massage. And then you can have uh, a, a, a raw collared salad in the winter. And that's interesting too, sometimes when you're in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got dragged down the rabbit hole of food, which is easily done. Um, if, if you're listening to this video and you're doing real fun things with your collards, then feel free to you know share them. We've got that Facebook group that I'll leave a link um, for you to access if you're not already a part of it, but we'd love to know what you're doing with the collards and what you think, certainly in terms of flavor and, and texture. Um, to, to give you guys some information about the actual project and the seed selection, we're going to talk through uh, a few things just so that you're set up for success as the season progresses. To, to this point in time, more or less, we've just been in normal collard growing mode. There's not really been any specific selection or seed saving things happening yet because collards are a biannual they won't start flowering until they've gone through this cold period i wanted to quickly talk about the cold because that's one specific thing that we're hoping this selection process can can help us with getting a much more cold tolerant collard depending on your variety collards can start kind of um dying due to the cold some of these perennial tree collards I've noticed you know aren't happy once it gets you know much below 25 they start dying we've got plenty of other collards that seem to do well in the teens once you start getting below that then it's you can start seeing quite a lot of damage on uh, a lot of different varieties of collards one thing that stood out with this population was we had a low of eight Fahrenheit in 2020 when we were first growing these collards and about a third of my population just died at, at that low temperature and the seeds we saved are from the survivors so what i've been noticing this year which was different to 2020 was we when we got that eight fahrenheit in 2020 there was this slow drop to this cold cold temperature we had snow on the ground it stayed cold for a while and then it slowly got warm again. What, what we've seen this winter is like fluctuating up and down. It's, we've had like temperature swings of like 50, 60 Fahrenheit within 24, 48 hours. And that's something that even though it's not got as cold as it did in 2020, the, the collards and plants in general, I think struggle to adapt to those rapidly changing temperatures. So I've seen some cold damage on the collards, even though we've only been in the low teens. Um, but I'm also seeing some collards that haven't got any cold damage. So in terms of uh, what you should be seeing in your own field as you look at the collards and go, oh, that one's not looking very happy, but that one is, that's kind of exactly what we want to experience. We wanna select for the ones that are gonna be most able to deal with temperature swings and super lows. So don't worry if you've got collards that are dying. We're, we're only in the first year of this selection project and it can take multiple years to get to a point where we're gonna consistently see um, real good tolerance to cold temperatures. So that's, that's one thing that you may already be observing in the field. Uh, I've actually got some photographs of 
the collar observations that I've been making and I'm going to share them. I'll probably put some into this video and I'll certainly share them in the email and the Facebook group so you can kind of see what I'm seeing and feel free to share your own photographs as well. Um, one thing that I thought it would be useful, um, Ira, is if you, for people that haven't saved collard seeds before, if you could kind of give us just like a, an expected overview of what we're going to observe between now and getting mature seeds, because, you know, collards are quite a, a long time in the ground if we're doing seed saving. Uh, so just set, set some realistic expectations for people if they're going to save seeds. Well, uh, one thing is, uh, as it warms up in the spring, uh, your collards are going to start greening up, up more if they have had a little damage, making new leaves and starting uh, to grow. And somewhere uh, in late March or April, you're going to start seeing uh, flowers happen. They're, they're going to bolt and start uh, having flowers and setting little pods uh, and, and even more like uh, pods over, you know, they keep, they keep flowering and setting pods over a six week period. And, you, uh, and this is a time when you need to pay attention to other brassicas you may have left in the ground because even though they didn't survive very well, they might make little uh, green leaves and try to flower and cross with your collar population. So get rid of them. Anything that you're not uh, having as a part of your uh, collar seed uh, saving. And then the pods take a while to mature, uh, to grow to their mature size and to dry. So you're talking about, you know, starting with flowering, say, you know, in April for, for most people, but for some people further south, March, uh, and then uh, you're gonna have to let the uh, pods mature and dry. And uh, one thing, and that's gonna happen, you know, somewhere between late May and the beginning of July, according to where your location is. Uh, and one thing to note, once the pods are full size and kind of filled out so you can kind of see the, you can feel the little seeds in them. Uh, if they have already started to turn tan and a big period of rain is coming, you would be better to harvest uh, either the whole flowering, uh, the whole seed stock or the ones that are more mature, the ones that are the older ones on that and put them inside to finish drying. I mean, actually any time after they uh, have all turn yellow and some of them are tan, uh, you'll have mature seed there. Um, I mean, you can leave them, but you're subject to getting moldy seeds if you have like a week of rainy weather uh, at that time. And um, when we bring them in, even when they look quite dry, we're gonna let them sit in uh, a well ventilated dry, place and dry another couple of weeks, sometimes another month or two <laughs> before we get around to uh, getting the seeds out of them. And uh, another thing uh, it, when they're going to seed is you have this nice well-behaved uh, two, three, maybe four foot plant. And sometimes when they go to seed, you have this five, six, seven feet plant that is uh, amazingly large and you're like, what happened? Uh, so, you know, be prepared for that. And for them, if you want, if you have a small garden for uh, holding them up uh, with some kind of stake so they don't fall over onto the surrounding plants. And what we're gonna do is um, going forward, we're gonna make some of these videos in the field. So we'll be able to show you each of these steps that Iris talked about, we'll show you in, in real time from, from our farm. So you can kind of like follow along step by step. So uh, if you get lost in some of the technicalities at this point or it feels a bit overwhelming, then don't worry, we're gonna kind of 
guide guide through the entire process uh, of seed saving and what to expect and, and come out with some more tips as we go along uh, so that hopefully we can all have successful seed saving by the time we get into, well, for, for me, it was July of 20. 21 before I got seeds um, and I'd started those seeds the year before at the end of July so really it can be a 12-month a, a process to go from seed to seed and so you're you're saving your seeds and then you're pretty much planting them again for the next year's crop which is you know very different than if you were just growing collards for eating uh, it's a, definitely an extra commitment to do the seed saving aspect <laughs> yeah um so I quickly wanted to talk a little bit about some selection, but again, we're going to talk about this more going forward, but a, a few people have asked this um, by email and, and Facebook, so I wanted to give it a little bit of time. It, in terms of this community seed selection project, we've sent out this massively genetically diverse mix of collards. And for the Utopian Sea Project, we're looking to develop a, a regional collard mix that is as cold tolerant as possible, maintains beautiful diversity in terms of the looks of the collards, so the, all the different colors and, and leaf shapes, um, while also being delicious. So that, that's kind of like our selection criteria. And so some of you are gonna be able to make selections that further our own goals in terms of that criteria. So for example, if if you have a collard plant that survives, you know, five degrees Fahrenheit and has some beautiful coloration and, and meets my criteria, then I'm gonna be like, I would love some of those seeds back at the end of the season and I will incorporate them into my mix and we'll be able to push forward with our goals. But if you um, are living, you know, in, northern Georgia and you only get like 20 Fahrenheit lows then I'm less interested in your seeds coming back to me because they've not met my criteria of surviving really cold temperatures they may have those genetics but you know I don't really want to bring them into my population because they may not have those genetics but that doesn't mean that this community seed selection project doesn't apply to you because what I really wanna do with this mix is encourage as many people as possible to start selecting their own regionally relevant seed population. Because this is just such an opportunity for everyone that has these seeds to see so much diversity that they could select for whatever they wanted. Um, and that might be, you know, pest damage, drought tolerance, maybe you don't fertilize and you're selecting for the plants that do really well in low fertility. There's, there's so many different ways you could take this population that even if your seeds aren't relevant to me, they're still hyper relevant to you. And it can be really exciting just to save seeds and um, guide this population wherever you want to take it. So think, think carefully, pay attention to the plants, be observant, which plants do you fall in love with? What, what is it that really jumps out to you? What do you really like about these? And then you can start saving seeds whichever direction you want. You're not obligated to do exactly what I want or need. There's one, so, so do whatever you want on one side. If you've got really cold tolerant ones or, or plants that are meeting my criteria, then you know we'll stay in touch and maybe you can send me some seeds back. But there's this kind of like other project that I didn't intend at the beginning, but it's starting to become more um, prevalent in the top of my mind. And it's the amount of purples and blue that I'm seeing in this population is surprising me because we didn't have that many purple and blues in the parent population. There was there was there wasn't any one variety that was like a total purple blue variety. It, it kind of like had purple coloration amongst the green. And yet I'm seeing a lot of purple leaves coming through. Uh, so in, in this cross and mix of genetics, we're seeing more, more purples pop up. And as well as having this like beautifully diverse collection, I'm kind of thinking it would be incredible to also select for a uh, just a purple collection. Uh, so this is kind of an open invite for anyone to get in touch with me that if you've got a fairly large collection of collards that you're growing from this mix and you're seeing a lot of purples and you want to be part of like a sub 
purple selection group, then what we'd be asking you to do is once they start bolting, it would be to cut out all the greens and just leave the purple plants to flower. Uh, so if you're, if you're interested in that, or that's something that you think you could do, then let's talk about joining together and having another little selection criteria, which is just the purple group. And then we'll, we'll be taking this population in two distinct lines under a TUSP umbrella, the Utopian Sea Project umbrella, but then hopefully all of you as individuals will be carrying this population forward in whatever direction you want. So that's a little bit on selection and we'll definitely come back to this as we're doing it actively in the garden. Um, Ira, I thought we could just wrap up. I know you are growing these collards over in Virginia. Is, is there anything that's kind of like standing out to you or, or that you're excited about when you see this population or any, any selections that uh, jump well, out in your brain? Well, I did notice the purpleness, mm. uh, and I like these purple ones. So I was like, "Oh, this is interesting." Uh, but we'll see if after this latest round of uh, three weeks of up and down and up and down, mm -hmm. how how they do, because uh, it's been rough on the poor guys. Uh, but they do look pretty in pictures when they have frost on them. <laughs> <laughs> and they taste better, right? With the, the, yeah, they do. As they, long do. As they don't die. <laughs> if they don't die. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, the I, purples I definitely think are going to be a strong, a strong one to come out of this, and I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, so hopefully, hopefully a few people have have pretty good plantings and and could maybe go the, go the purple route with us. That would be super fun. <laughs> Well, I'm, let's let's wrap this up then, so that we don't go too long with this video, um, and then know that we're going to be checking in a little bit more regularly now that we're getting into kind of active seed production mode with these plants. Certainly, in the next um, month or two, we can expect to see that bolting and, and flowering action happening. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ira, for taking the time and, and sharing your knowledge. Yeah, thanks for keeping this project going and uh, doing all this sharing with. Uh, the participants. Yeah, it's going to be super fun. And obviously, Southern Exposure has been critical in getting those seeds out to people. So it's a great partnership. Cool. Okay. Until next time. Until next time.